Coming up on this week's show, how to turn your iPhone into a classic PC. A long lost Pokemon game gets rediscovered. And we go inside Nintendo and the classic Earthbound with Marcus Lindblom. The Retro Hour podcast is made possible each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, if you're an old school fan of the Game Boy, we need to tell you about this incredible new book of theirs, Game Boy, the box art collection that celebrates the wonders of Nintendo's million selling portable system. Check out that and lots more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 271, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And great to have you joining us for another nostalgia-filled episode where we reminisce about classic video games, take you behind the scenes with the people that actually made them back in the day with a healthy dose of personal nostalgia laid on as well. Because, you know, actually I've been realising recently, you know, retro gaming now, it seems as actually a genre in itself, isn't it? You know, if you go in any of the kind of digital stores, you know, like the um, Nintendo eStore or your Xbox and search retro gaming, it's now a legitimate genre of gaming. I've been noticing that with streamers as well. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a whole retro category on Twitch now. Oh, gosh, I wonder if we fit into that with your Twitch. Yeah, 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 I've been tagging myself in it. (laughs) But no, you are right. I was on Xbox Arcade, like Xbox Arcade, God, that's retro, Xbox Live the other day, and they had a 70% off sale, and I went into it, and there was a retro section, and I downloaded, like, DuckTales for, like, 50p. It does feel like it's something that, you know, because when we started doing this podcast five years ago, that kind of felt like, you know, retro was kind of at its peak then, didn't it? We kind of felt like we started doing the show when maybe retro were peaked and we wondered, is it still going to be a thing in like, you know, another five, six years? But it just seems like it's getting bigger all the time. Now the companies are on board and stuff. It's, it's, it's starting to change. And, you know, this week's guest is from the biggest gaming company in the world. And we hardly talk about them because it's really hard to get guests about Nintendo. We've had, you know, folks talk about Rare and other companies, but getting a Nintendo guest, oh God, really tough. Yeah, today we're going to be joined by Marcus Lindblom. And you're right, I mean, we talk about Nintendo pretty much every week in the news section, but actually getting a guest on who worked at Nintendo is really difficult because a lot of them sign, you know, NDAs that often last beyond the time that they were employed there. And I know Marcus, for example, you're going to hear in the interview we did very soon, he tried to release a book about his time at Nintendo and they blocked it. So they're very protective, yeah, about kind of letting the outside world in, if you like. But Marcus is going to come on today and tell us some stories because, I mean, he's got such an interesting history. He lived in Japan for four years in the late 80s, obviously when the arcade scene was huge out there. And, I mean, I know you've been out there in more recent years, Joe, but you can imagine what Mm. an exciting place that must have been back in, like, 1989. Yeah, man, that would have been unreal. I would have loved to have just, like, kind of stepped back for a week into 1989 and just kind of see it or something. So that's going to be really interesting to hear about. You'd be like, everything's so slow at loading. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, probably. (laughs) Well, one of the things we talk about in this interview, I mean, Marcus, he's best known for doing the English version of the game Earthbound. And really, I I do say version because it wasn't a straight translation. He didn't just have the job of, you know, translating Japanese into English. He actually kind of rewrote a lot of the story in there and changed a lot of the things that were only really relevant to a Japanese audience so it'd work in America. So there's actually, it was quite a big job doing that. And we talk a lot more in the interview about the the process that they used back in the day to do these kind of translations of Japanese games to Western audiences. Because, I mean, infamously, there were so many bad translations, particularly in the NES era, wasn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you say, it's not it's not so much a translation, it's a localization. I wonder if that's something, because Earthbound, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it didn't come out in the UK until much, much, much later, like decades later. So, you know, maybe that's got something to do with the kind of like the localization of it as well. It's like, oh God, it's hard enough to make it American, let alone, you know, for the United Kingdom. You know, the so. interesting thing is this is like a, such a Joe episode as well. And Joe only only manages to get the Amiga episodes don't you, where you could come on it. Well, I was going to say the, the original idea was it was for me to do the interview, wasn't it? But um, unfortunately, my, my nine till five job, which isn't always nine till five, um caused me to be working 11 till 8 at the moment um so yeah we couldn't i couldn't jump on it which was really upsetting because i don't actually know that much about earthbound i know it was it was mother and i know you know it's part of a series and stuff like that but yeah i would have loved to jump on that like one of our first ever nintendo episodes as well Well, 
it's amazing because uh, Marcus talks about how he worked with, he was working for Nintendo USA mm. and uh, how Nintendo of America and how they work with the Japanese Nintendo and actual yeah. staff members came over. But then how he worked with guys later on, like uh, met Dylan Cuthbert, the guys from Argonaut that did um, Star Fox, you know, there, there's oh, yeah. a whole, whole connection there. And uh, Nintendo made sure their quality was still on the product in the end. Mm. So, you know, I think you're really going to enjoy listening to this one, Jay. Yeah. And, of course, the audience. <laughs> it's not just for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, you're right. This is such a Joe episode. It means you can kick back and just enjoy the interview this week, Joe. He's really good. Marcus Lindblom is coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, while we're talking about Nintendo, actually, I did quickly mention this in the intro to this week's show. Uh, Bitmap Books, our sponsor, they have got the most incredible book if you're a fan of the Game Boy that you need to check out. Yeah, man, this is absolutely awesome. We go on about bitmap books all the time, but the quality of these books is absolutely fantastic. And like you say, if you're a fan of Nintendo, then you've got to be a fan of the Game Boy. This is the Game Boy, the box art collection, which is over almost 400 pages of just pixel box art of all these different classic Game Boy games. And what I really love about it is, as well as the beautiful artwork, you just get nice little simple, you know, text paragraphs just about the game as well, when it came out and stuff like that. I'm a simple guy, just straightforward and simple like that is amazing. These make absolutely amazing gifts as well. Dan got me one of these a couple of years ago. You know, it's so much better than getting, you know, you know, a jumper or something like that. Go out there, pick this up. I was going to get you a jumper for your birthday this year. I know, there we go. Well, get me the Game Boy <laughs> box art collection. <laughs> you know, what I do love about jumpers. this. <laughs> what I love about this book is that it celebrates the box art on mm. Game Boy games. And really, I mean, looking at these, really paying attention to the quality of them. Because obviously they're a lot smaller than kind of, you know, a, a SNES cartridge, you know, the bigger boxes that you got with yeah. those. And I didn't realise actually how detailed and how vibrant a lot of these are. And the fact that they really enhance these images and you get them over big pages in this book, you can really see, you know, the attention to detail that was included in a lot of these box art Even when you go to like video game shows, you see like Game Boy carts just stacked up. And you, you don't see the boxes or, or the manuals or that kind of art. Yeah, really. yeah your mum's always threw them out. <laughs> so it's interesting <laughs> to actually see, you know, the, you know, like Dan says, the blown up box art because we're so used to just seeing the little like two inch cartridge with like an inch sticker on it, you know, which is half filled up with, you know, Nintendo seal, you know, quality seal of approval and stuff like that. So this is really cool to actually get your hands on it and like you say, see it in like a proper book. I did wonder as well, you know, the fact that the Game Boy had obviously monochrome graphics and mm. the fact that like you said the cartridges were so small whether they actually worked harder on making the box art really draw you in you know because it's really all they had to work with really isn't it yeah try to try and sell it more i guess so uh, definitely worth a look if you're a fan of the game boy a real celebration of game boy box art and you can get that right now and of course support the retro hour podcast by supporting our sponsors on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk now we've got plenty of new stories to talk about this week now this one <laughs> Popped up on Reddit last week, and people have been going wild for this. Now, this is a sealed Pokemon Blue cart. Now, this is a box version of the game from 1998 that's been found, and this was actually supposed to be someone's birthday gift back in 1998. Now, I'm not sure if you know how much a sealed box copy of Pokemon Blue goes for these days, but it is Generally a small fortune if you see one of these on eBay. I'm confused because, like, Pokemon... I remember loads of people having red and blue and stuff. And yeah. I, why is blue so rare? Maybe it's because it's Pokemon or Poke cards or something? So the, I think the thing is with Pokemon... So obviously um, it started with Pokemon red and blue. That's, you know, how the whole craze started. Um, it came out in Japan in 96, and then I think, you know, America and UK, and I think it was like 98. I just don't think, you know, as as crazy as it was, as big as a game as it was, I just don't think they made, like, obviously they probably made a couple of million of them, but just, they're just not been made in, in the quantities that the later games were made in. Um, and obviously it kind of comes back to what we were just saying about, you know, the book just then. A lot of the, I, I know hardly anybody who ever kept, I don't think any of my friends growing up, because I'm true and true Game Boy and Game Boy, uh, the Game Boy Advance kind of like, I'm the perfect age for that when I was a kid. None of us had the boxes. None yeah, of us had, had the manuals. I, you know, I got Pokemon Red and Blue in Christmas '99. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what happened to the box, and like they were gone straight away. Like, you know, my mum chucked them out or anything. So, it's actually the box which is rare, I think, rather than the cartridge. 
I guess um, they absolutely rinsed them as well. Like when Pokemon came out and kids got it, you know, they were playing that for a good like mm. four or five years. You know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So having a, a sealed one in in mm-hmm. an original condition with the manuals and everything, yeah. yeah. But well, well like, how was it found? It was in his parents' attic. It was meant to be his birthday present in 1998, and they got him red and blue because that seemed to be like the thing. Like everybody seemed to get them both together, and they he doesn't really know how, but they lost blue and didn't really realize they lost it. So he just got red for his birthday. And now his parents have retired, you know, and he's obviously grown up. His parents were doing like a big clear out and they found it in the attic. Completely boxed, never opened. Yeah. And then some people on the Reddit thread here are saying, you know, it mentions in this article on a Unilad that we'll link up in our show notes that they've been selling for upwards of $3,000. Some people have linked eBay auctions where they've gone for five grand. Yeah. But the nice story here is the fact that this guy, he said that, He's grateful to have such wonderful parents who not only bought him the two Pokemon games, admittedly, he didn't get the second one for 23 (laughs) years, but he's not going to sell it. He's actually going to treasure this. And, you know, it's going to be his birthday gift from his dad, even though it took that long to get to him. He's going to look after it and maybe even play it, which a lot of people are kicking off about. Yeah, and I I love that, to be fair. You know, like you say, everybody's saying, oh, you should should get it graded, but get it in a plastic box and all this. And he was just saying, you know, I'm not going to sell it. It's the nostalgia. And he's got nostalgia for the Pokemon games. He says, you know, playing them with his sister, playing Pokemon Stadium with his parents, you know. So I think that's I think that's awesome that he's going to keep it. And he's not keeping it as like, a, oh, I'm going to keep this so it's worth even more in a couple of years. He's keeping it because his dad got it him. You I know. know, my mind's blown by this article. I'm amazed that it's so rare. It, is it like Link and Zelda or something like that? You know, they're always really rare or like... It's Mario, just, or I, it's, it's so iconic. It's not. It looked last week that that Mario card, you know, that Mario cartridge that went for like six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. I think it's just the fact that everyone got them and ripped them open, and there's yeah. just not many sealed left. I guess. Yeah, it, it's not so much the game is rare because if I'm sure if we Google it, Pokemon Blue probably sold like five million copies. It's that there's just no boxes for it. It's because of you know Nintendo up until what the GameCube, they always had cardboard boxes for games and they just got thrown out and they just got destroyed like you say just ripped apart ripped open pokemon was aimed for the kids it was literally it was a a game that like anybody from like five years old up to whenever you know but you know it was mostly like seven eight nine year olds that were playing it they weren't looking after these boxes they were just ripping them Mm. apart throwing them in the (laughs) bin straight away so it's it's the fact that it's in such good condition that it's so rare i think i i was using a, a copy of quake um to hold my monitor up there you go Box. There you go. And then I my, went on eBay and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> my mate, my mate about five years ago gifted me Worms Party for the PS1. He used to use it as a paint palette for his Warhammer. <laughs> so the box is just completely painted over. I got this from a charity shop for two quid. Yeah, exactly. So it's crazy, isn't it? You know, it does make you think that, and I've been thinking this probably for the last 10 years or so, that every game I buy, you know, particularly ones that are kind of, Famous franchises, like, you know, Mario games and stuff like that. Should I buy two copies and keep one sealed? You know, they're still going to be worth... Dan, you just keep them sealed anyway, because you don't play them. (laughs) (laughs) Red Dead Redemption three years later. I should have left it on for another 20 years. It'd be worth a fortune. It's retro by now. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, that is very good. I love the fact that, you know, yeah, that the guy who's found it is keeping it for sentimental reasons and not just talking it for money. That's, you know, lovely story, I think, that. So um, it just makes you wonder what else is lurking in people's attics and stuff around the world, doesn't it? Exactly. Now, let's talk about this story, Metroid Prime's 2D fan remake. Now, this is something... Um, obviously a GameCube classic back in the day, but this has been something that we've been seeing online for quite a while now, that apparently this fan-made 2D remake that they're calling Prime 2D is now actually playable. Because I thought this was an April Fool's Day joke when I saw it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so i sort of familiar with the Metroid games. I've got Super Metroid for the SNES. And I've completed it, but I've not completed it since I was like 12. I played Metroid Prime 1 and 2 for the GameCube and enjoyed them, but I borrowed them off friends. So this actually went into development in 2004. So wow. the team behind <laughs> it, uh, a group of guys called, they're called Team SCU, um, who are indie game developers from what I understand. And they've been working on this for 17 years. Now, they went quiet five years ago. Uh, sorry. So in 2017, they posted saying that they were still working on it, but they hadn't posted anything in five years at that point. And then they haven't really posted much since 2017. But like you say on April 1st, they posted this and people have, you know, you're not the only one. A lot of people assumed it was an April Fool's joke when they posted all the like screenshots of it and stuff. 
But no, it's out there. The demo is out there. Um, you know, I've been watching people play it and it's racking up some views, a couple of hundred thousand views, you know, on um, people's playthroughs, which has only been out for a few days. And uh, yeah, it looks like you can play like the first 20, 25 minutes of the game and it looks beautiful. It looks absolutely beautiful. So the original Metroid Prime was kind of 3D. Uh, yeah, so they've, it was a f- they've 2 d eyesed it. And, yeah, <laughs> you know. So so the original Metroid Prime for the GameCube, there was three of them. They were essentially first-person shooters, but they were like puzzle platformer first-person shooters, obviously in fully 3D. And they're beautiful games as well. Like they look, you know, stunning for the GameCube. Obviously Metroid, Super Metroid, and then like Metroid, uh, what's it called? Metroid Fusion, I think it's called. They're all like classic 2D Metroid games. And essentially, that's what they've done to this. They've made it look like one of those kind of like, you know, SNES kind of Game Boy Advance games. But it looks really modern at the same time. It, it, you'd have to look at it, Ravi, but it looks beautiful. It's it's nice, though, because usually you think the route would be like Metro Prime HD and they'd do like, yeah. a, you know, Unreal Engine version. But to see it in a kind of 2D, like, yeah, nicely done sprites, you know, uh, maybe it, you'll be able to play some levels that you remember mm. in first person in like a 2D different way, yeah. kind of more platformery. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it, it comes from people have been begging for this. Like they've been begging for an official, you know, Metroid game for a while. Like they've, they've done a few spin off ones and stuff like that. And I think, I think it's Metroid Prime 4, you know, was announced like four years ago and it's still not out. I could be wrong. But this looks like it, yeah, for the Switch, it just looks like a proper spiritual successor. This looks like it could have been done by Nintendo. And yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't look like they've grabbed assets from like other games. It looks like they've built it from the ground up to me. It looks bang on, like the parallax mm. scrolling and stuff in the background, and yeah, it just looks really well done, like yeah. a proper release. Yeah, I'm sure next week though it'll be gone. It'll be cease and desist. <laughs> that is a point I was going to make here. It's saying here now. There's an article on Polygon that I'll put in our show notes, and um, there was actually another fan game. I think we talked about it at the time actually another Metroid Two remake um, that mm. was back in 2017. Yeah, uh, a day later, as soon as that went online, Nintendo did a copyright claim, shut the project down. Over 14,000 people have downloaded Prime 2D already. Oh, wow. But it does kind of feel like the fact that they're using these assets, it does feel like Nintendo obviously are going to have to close it down because it's what Nintendo's lawyers do. Yeah. So it makes you wonder why they've devoted so much time to doing this, knowing that it's, it's got get... such a limited shelf life. It's, it's a bit odd. Yeah, but at the same time, they released it on April 5th. And we're now on, at the point of recording this, it's April 13th and it's still up there. So knowing our look, it'll be gone by the time the episode comes out in three days. <laughs> <That'll> um, <laughs> but yeah, usually usually Nintendo are a little bit quicker than that, aren't they? So maybe they've just not figured it out yet. Maybe they've just not seen it yet. But like you say, 14,000 downloads. The video I was watching earlier on had 150,000 plays. I, I think they must be huge fans to do this, but 15 mm. y- years, isn't it? Yeah, 15 years, over 15 years. So we'll see. Before the game was retro. Yeah, before the game. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it funny? We look at it now and it's like, oh yeah, that looks like a retro, Metroid retro, bloody hell. That looks like a retro DS game or a retro Game Boy Advance game. (laughs) But when they were making it, it was probably all new tech. I do love as well, there is um, a couple of comments on this article. There's a bit of a sweepstake going on how long Nintendo are going to cease and desist it. You know, is it going to be a week, two weeks, four weeks? So (laughs) that's running here as well. And they're saying, you know, really... The hype with Nintendo fan-made games, it's difficult because it's kind of like Fight Club, you know. Mm-hmm. If you talk about it, you've ensured the demise of it, really. So um, yeah. we probably haven't contributed much to the uh, the efforts of this by mentioning it on the podcast, but grab it while you can. You know what's interesting? I wonder, though, if they might do this as a way to get attention onto the project, then obviously they're waiting for Nintendo's cease and desist to come along, but whether then they're going to kind of relaunch it with their own kind of branding on it, you know, that could be a good way of getting marketing, I think. Yeah, you know what, that, you know, um, there was a game, we never really spoke about it, but there was a game called Daymare 1998, which essentially came from, we're going a little bit off topic here, it's essentially it's a Resident Evil 4 clone, but what happened was the guys, it was an an Italian studio, Indian indie studio, and they were making a Resident Evil 2, like, you know, fan remake, in the Resident Evil 4 engine around 2015, 2014. And essentially they got contacted by Capcom. You know, you've got to stop making this because we're actually making a Resident Evil 2 uh, remake. But you know what Capcom did? They invited them down to the studio and said, this is what we're working on. And they invited all the team down and said this, and they actually helped them make Daymare 1998. They actually helped them, wow, gave them okay. ideas and said, you know, this is a really cool remake you guys are making. 
unfortunately we need you to stop making it but you know this is what we're doing at the moment could, go make, could your, be, go uh, make your own game with it l- like sonic mania you know get them on board yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do this and release it for the switch yeah but yeah, i mean you know, if nintendo had sense to do that i can't see them doing it though. i can't see them doing it either but i'm just saying you know maybe they should take a leaf out of like say sega's book and capcom's book yeah or whether they'll just kind of you know, maybe they've got another version ready to go without the metroid branding on there you know, and it's going to be their own game, just, you know, influenced by it. Maybe they could get yeah. around it that way, which yeah, would be... Retroid. Good way doing it. Retroid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You Have that idea first. on us. <laughs> so if you do want to grab it, um, providing it's still up when the show goes live, we'll put it in our show notes and everything else we talk about at theretrohour.com. Now, Ravi, I know you're excited to uh, get your new iPhone that should be arriving very soon. Obviously, when you unbox your iPhone, the first thing you're going to do, I imagine, is to transform it into an MS-DOS PC. <laughs> I'd love to do that, but <laughs> carrying around everything would be a bit awkward, wouldn't it? Now, this is a YouTuber called Niles Mitchell, who's done just that. Now, you've got to check out this video. Um, it's about 17 minutes long. And he's actually set up his iPhone on a little stand with a floppy disk drive, a CD-ROM drive, a PS2 keyboard, PS2 mouse, and actually he's running a DOS emulator on here, and you can actually use all these devices via the, um, you know, the adapter that lets you plug a camera into your iPhone, the USB interface. He's using an emulator called iDOS that lets it, the iPhone talk to all these different peripherals, and he can actually use it like it was a PC from back in about 1995. I think it's amazing the fact that it's an emulator on the iPhone that's running, because Android, you can load up loads of emulators, you can have ROMs, but I, iOS and Apple, they're really, really kind of cautious about having ROMs being loaded or other pieces of code being loaded onto it. And uh, I'm amazed that this is on the actual App Store. Well, the story of that is actually mentioned in um, in the video. And it's quite interesting because this emulator, iDOS, it's kind of been off and on the iOS store for a couple of years. Like you mentioned, you know, when it did originally appear um, back in 2010. It first went onto the store. It was only on for a short while, and then Apple pulled it down for the reason you said, you know, they didn't want emulators that could run third-party code at that time. And then it appeared again about six years ago called iDOS 2, and Apple have actually left it alone since then. And then he made a big update last September. Now, you know, obviously stuff on the iPhone can access document storage on the device now. And he's actually, he was amazed that Apple let him actually store files onto iPhones and load them into his emulator. So that means you can download all of your disk images from your old DOS games, put them on your iPhone. And obviously that makes an emulator so much more useful having access to storage. It's it's mad that you can do that because like, you know, even transferring from the iPhone, if you're doing a backup, you have to do it in iTunes or like um, with the latest mac minis and the and the new apple silicon it won't let you install it remotely onto a onto a separate drive like your main drive you know it's all starting to get even more locked down than it previously was and uh it's mad that you know he's saying you got a floppy disk drive working with it and um the way that it worked was it was an imitation super disk drive which is just just mad. <laughs> yeah, he said there is some um, workarounds that you have to do to get this working, because obviously you can't just plug, you know, a standard disk drive into your iPhone and it recognises it. Um, but there is, yeah, it's, it's a device here called the iMotion Super Disk Drive, and it was around the era when the zip drives were around, but it was also backwards compatible to standard three-and-a-half-inch floppy disks. So the way it appears to the emulator is like um, like a zip drive, essentially. So it's a D drive. So, you know, rather than having like an A drive on the machine, it recognises it as D. And then the CD-ROM drive that he's got is a special one that's designed for smart TVs, which are often locked down in the same way that your iPhone is. Um, So actually, it appears to the system like a FAT32, like USB drive. So you can recognise it as an external hard disk, but it's a CD-ROM drive. So there is quite a bit of work around these had to do. But if you watch this video, he's on there playing all these uh, old school games and uh, it does run like, you know, a decent... MS DOS emulator that obviously not the keyboard and the mouse and the drives would fit in your pocket. Imagine if you could cast that as well. So you, <laughs> could, you, could, Apple just, TV. you could just use it as your little device, and then there was a maybe a cast option or some kind of hack that you could do to cast it to your TV, and and then use that as an MS DOS computer and the like iPhone as the little little driver. <laughs> it's pretty cool. 
You can do screen mirroring, actually. So I imagine you probably could do that. Yeah, that, that if you got that an Apple TV work. and like, uh, or or on your Chromecast or whatever, or plug one in, hack one into a CRT. That's the way to do it, isn't it? <laughs> Put your phone up, but it's probably really easy to do in Android. This is, but like seeing it on the iPhone is pretty impressive with that whole kind of lockdown and walled garden approach that they have. Because, you know, I've got a Pentium One PC next to me, and this thing is a beast. You know, if I lift it up, it hurts my back. But the fact that now we can walk around with something, you know, infinitely more powerful than that that can run the same software, and you just put it in your shirt pocket, it is amazing how far we've come in a couple of decades, isn't it? I, I want to have a go now. As soon as I get that new iPhone, I'm on it. First thing you're going to do, Revy. Now, of course, we're going to be talking about Earthbound very soon. Now, there's actually been a fan reimagining what Earthbound would look like as a modern 3D game. Now, this is it's obviously quite a visual story because you need to see the pictures to appreciate this, but I'm sure we can describe it, and we will link it in our show notes as well. But it kind of looks a bit like... Yeah, if, if you've got Earthbound and you made it a modern game, it reminds me a bit of the, um, the Zelda Link's Awakening graphics, that kind of claymation look. Or, or even kind of Animal Crossing. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know what? That's a good... Actually, it looks look, look, look like a bit of a cross of... Link's Awakening, the remake, and Animal Crossing to be to kind of like picture it, but yeah, I think you know you say this is a fan visualization, isn't it, of Earthbound, aka Mother? I feel like Nintendo. It's a first game, actually, Mother. Yeah, not, a, not yeah. Earthbound. Okay, yeah. so I feel like Nintendo need to do this because of there's a there's a massive cult kind of following to the Mother games, Earthbound games, and you just don't see enough about it. In like, I know it came, you know, a couple of them came out in America and stuff like that, but they were quite limited from what I understand, you know, and there was translations for the Game Boy Advance. And, you know, I think only one of them came out for the SNES. I could be wrong, but I just feel like they should do this. You know, they did it with, with Zelda and I think it will, it will sell like if they did this, cause this looks beautiful. And um, it's kind of done it in Blender, which is a 3d program for the PC. So maybe they could take the assets and actually put this into a game engine and mm. make this like a, a, a playable demo. <laughs> which would just be amazing to see. But it's it's really in a beautiful style. Like, the lighting's fantastic on this. What I think's interesting, though, just to kind of say how beautiful it is. Now, I'm not going to butcher his name, but when the guy who made this tweeted it, he tagged the creator, the Japanese creator of the games, and said, thank you for creating such an amazing game, and he retweeted it as well. Oh, that's good. So, but I'm not going to butcher his name because it's Japanese and I can't, <laughs> I can't. But I think that's really cool that, you know, as a fan, you make that, and then the actual original creator is just like, yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> it shares yeah, it. it makes it all worthwhile. Mm. Um, but you know, what, what is interesting, though, because we'll hear more, obviously, in the, the interview with Marcus that's coming up in a moment, is that, you know, the mother, actually, obviously, we, we didn't get it over here, and then Earthbound came out in America, but actually the sales on Earthbound originally were very disappointing, and we kind of go into that. Um, a lot of people blamed Nintendo's marketing that was trying to be too edgy for, you know, their style. And really, you know, the sales figures were a disappointment. Um, but over the years, it's kind of got that cult following now. And we saw it when it got released on the the NES Classic, that it does kind of feel like the time could be right for them to do like an HD remaster and actually people to appreciate a lot more than they did yeah. when the original game came out. Yeah, and a lot more people do know about it now. And the fact that like even in, you know, the original Smash Bros, you could play as NES. I don't, I he was definitely in Smash Bros uh, Melee, but I, I'm not sure if he was in the first one. But... He was the main character from Earthbound, and I remember playing Smash Bros. Melee and Melee, and just being like, "Oh, who's Ness?" And my mate was like, "Oh, he's just like a Nintendo character because he's named after Ness, you know, NES kind of thing." But now, you know, I think you know <laughs> we just didn't know what Earthbound was in the UK. But now, so many more people know who that is, and they know who these characters are from these Japanese games and stuff. So, like you say, I think it definitely is the right time for it. Yeah, and the world's all smaller now as well. Mm. You know, people find out about franchises that we were disconnected from as kids so come on nintendo make it happen now before we get into our interview with marcus it's time to mention this actually a really cool another fan remake actually which seems to be kind of a bit of a theme this week um maybe people have had more time during lockdown over the last year to focus on these things but whatever the reason is i'm glad that they're doing it and this is lotus esprit turbo challenge for the atari ste now obviously we've done an entire episode with Sean Southern about two years ago. Um, we talked about the Lotus games. One of my favourite racing series. Used to love that as a kid. Lotus 2 was always my favourite, but the original game, definitely one of the most loved racing games from back in the early 90s. But the version on the Atari ST, which I actually didn't think was a bad version, there is 
an upgraded version of this that's available now if you've got the more enhanced model, the Atari STE, that came out later. But actually, even though it had more powerful hardware, you know the way it works. Usually, developers will make a game for the lowest common denominator and they won't release a special version for something that, you know, only a small section of the user base has got. But now, all these years later, 30 years on, there is a new fan version, Lotus STE version 1.0 that's available to download for free now. And they've put some really cool upgrades in here. Now, they've actually used some of the hardware that you only find in the Atari STE, including using the Blitter chip to um, make the graphics much more smooth than the original. You know, it scrolls really nicely. You've got more scenery there too. Uh, the background mountains move from side to side. They've got like, you know, nice color gradients in the sky and even improved the music and the sound effects in the game as well. So really it's a major upgrade from the original game that really puts it on par with like, you know, the Amiga and the Mega Drive version, which, you know, for a fan to upgrade a game 30 years later to bring it up to that level, I think is pretty impressive. It's good to see some love for the STE, you know, because uh, a lot of people just default do go to the ST. And uh, this this is a fantastic series as well, Lotus. Um, I'm really, really into it, yeah. <laughs> um, I did like Lotus 3 so much, but it's good to see the original one getting some love. Yeah, I mean, Lotus 2 also came out on the ST, so maybe, you know, this team, because they've done such a good job on this, it would be nice if maybe they can um, focus their efforts on the second game next as well and give that, you know, a bit of a, an ST upgrade. That would be really good. So, um, yeah, nice to see the ST getting a bit of love and some uh, development on the platform as well. So if you want to download that, that will be in our show notes at the retro hour. I've got a quick com. question for you, Dan. Yeah. Have you played Horizon Chase Turbo yet? I think I've seen, is that on, that's on the Switch, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's on everything yeah. at the moment, but uh, it's just so playable. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I've got a feeling I did buy that on my Switch about a year ago. and uh, It's on open. I still haven't played it yet, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Them sealed games, this week, man. <laughs> <laughs> Even what I think this is a digital download and I still haven't played oh, it yet. It? So, um, <laughs> yeah, they, there's something for me to do this weekend. Uh, thanks for the tip. Now, we are going to be chatting to Marcus Lindblom stories from Inside Nintendo, Earthbound as well in just a moment. Before we do, let's just take a quick second to give a massive thank you to our wonderful friends at ExpressVPN, who've sponsored this week's episode. Now, obviously, we're all fans of Netflix, and I think it's fair to say we've completely rinsed most of our local Netflix libraries over the last 12 months that we've been mostly at home. And obviously, I mean, if you're a Netflix subscriber, they keep raising the prices so regularly. Now, the thing about it is, if you're paying for this every month, you need to be smart about this and make sure that you're getting your value by using ExpressVPN like we do. Now, we've talked about this on the show before. Netflix in your country is different from someone in America or Japan gets because there are actually different Netflix libraries, I think around 100 of them on last count, that you can choose from. And by using ExpressVPN, you can pick which country's Netflix you access. Like, for example, if you've got a favourite show that's not on the UK Netflix, do what Ravi does, change ExpressVPN, hit the button, and suddenly you're connected to ExpressVPN USA. Oh, yeah, and I've, I've been watching some awesome stuff. Like, ExpressVPN is just so fast as well. You know, I, I haven't got any lag on there or anything. I can just browse through really quickly. And uh, there's some shows on there that you just can't get on UK Netflix or whichever country you're in, apart from the American one. And it works with all all the different countries. So, you know, you can check out some Australian stuff. You can check out some manga. But um, I've been watching The Leprechaun with Warwick Davies. <laughs> you know, do you remember that film? I do remember Is that it. like infamously a terrible movie? Yeah, the oh, first God, yeah. one's all right, man, with Jennifer Anderson. <laughs> it's number two, isn't it, that's meant to be oh, really Oh, God, bad. yeah, yeah. It's such a good film. But but Lep in the Hood was the later <laughs> one. So. A leprechaun in the Hood, Leprechaun in Space. <laughs> yeah, I've been watching Tom Cruise go mental on uh, Leah Remini Scientology in the Aftermath. And uh, that's Leah Remini of King of Queens as well. Yeah. Which is re- really insane, that, that TV show. And then I've been watching Jericho as well, which was one about um, a nuclear explosion uh, that happened in America. And then this ta- city, this town called Jericho gets separated and they have to like try and restore the power and communications and stuff. And it's all really nerdy, but also post-apocalyptic, which is really good fun. So I've been using Express to watch all of these. And, you know, I can watch it on my phone or I can do it on a router level. So I've actually got it set up on my router 
I just switch it and then suddenly one of my Wi-Fi networks becomes American. Yeah, so and it works on smart TVs, your phone, your laptop, your PC. And the good thing about it is it's obviously you can watch it in HD, zero buffering. It's really fast as well. Not just for Netflix, you can use it to unlock shows from other streaming services. You know, if you're in America, you want to watch a bit of BBC iPlayer, you can do that. So we want you to be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth by signing up to ExpressVPN right now. And by using our exclusive link, you will get three months for free on top of a one-year subscription. So claim it right now and help out the podcast by going to expressvpn.com slash retro. That's expressvpn.com slash retro to learn more. And a big thank you to our friends at ExpressVPN. Now, of course, we do have a patron as well that we run, and uh, we do mention this all the time, that the patron is the lifeblood of this show. Any costs that we get, our equipment, our web hosting, all of that, getting the audio to you each week, it's all thanks to our patrons. The cost of doing this show that we have regularly is all paid for by our patrons. And of course, we give a little back in return as well. Yeah, so there's like three levels of patron that you can do. Mm. You can do silver supporter, gold or platinum. And you get different rewards on each one. So the first one, silver supporter, you get an ad-free episode. And uh, that's like £3.50. So it's kind of like about 80p per episode, which is really incredibly cheap. And you also... That's like a can of Coke. A can of Coke or a Chucky bar, yeah. And then the gold level, you get a bonus episode of the After Hours podcast, which is the one that we do behind the scenes. And then platinum, you get a t-shirt as well. You get two mentions in the Hall of Fame and you get everything else from the uh, other tiers. Yeah, so, and really the reason you're doing this, I mean, you do get that extra podcast that we do, you know, a couple of times a month we try and do this. Um, And this is, you know, we we do different themes around each episode. And these are, you know, full, proper podcasts. I mean, I think the last one was probably longer than our regular episode, I think. because we love (laughs) chatting in it, so it just goes on and on. (laughs) The thing is, we don't tend to edit them either. So they just end up being like two hours long, which is like, whoops. (laughs) And of course, you can join us for our monthly patrons hangouts as well. Uh, We just did one on Sunday evening, as always. Oh, such a good... What kind of things did we talk about this week? Oh, God. We were talking about adverts. remember. We were talking about adverts. We were talking about... You know what? There was something we were like, oh, I'm going to mention that on the podcast because that was really interesting. And I can't remember what it was now. It was like cassette tapes or something mad like that. But we always end up on like some crazy like retro kind of topic, but not necessarily gaming, don't Our we? Old video formats. Yeah. We were talking yeah. about that. We were talking about like VHS quality. Mm -hmm. stuff like that yeah oh it's really good fun and also it's just good fun to see all the patrons and and talk about stuff that they've got like we had a couple of new faces which was really nice yeah we always do a bit of um collection porn don't we show off what you've got (laughs) so uh that's always fun i mean we'd love to see you there on our next one that will be coming up in a few weeks time and uh, unlock all of those episodes of the retro hour after hours and keep this podcast going you can back us on there on our website at the retrohour.com and of course you will get a mention in the retro hour hall of fame like this week thank you jonathan quilter peter simone rob hubers sam rhymes and pierre cressman who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find it on our website, theretrohour.com. Right then, time to get some inside stories from Nintendo and, of course, the classic Earthbound with our special guest, Marcus Lindblom, is next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for our favourite bit of the show when we welcome on our very special guest. And today, we're going to be talking about some really interesting games. One of the, actually the biggest gaming company in the world, of course, Nintendo, and the cult classic Super Nintendo game Earthbound, and lots more as well with our special guest this week. Welcome to the show, Marcus Lindblom. Hello. Hi, thank you very much for having me pleasure to have you on now before we get into your time at nintendo and the amazing work that you did there that i know particularly earthbound has become a cult classic over the years i mean let's kind of wind right back to the beginning what what was it initially that got you into computers and video games do you remember where it all started oh my goodness well so i'm certainly not terribly young so you know the first game i actually remember playing was like pong and i think the first game that we paid for was like a a little tank battle game, you know, many years ago, this would have been like early seventies or something, I would think. So I've played a lot of electronic games, but I also was a big board game fan. So for me, games have been kind of a lifelong hobby and, uh, 
uh, you know, played D&D in the 70s and stuff like that, too. So I was uh, kind of a gamer for a long time. And then I went to college, found girls, got off games for a bit, but got back into video games while I was there and just played a lot of arcade kind of stuff. And uh, and then also moved to Japan after I, I, uh, I married my wife. And we uh, we were there for like, well, we thought we were going to be there six months. We ended up being there for four years. And we you know, stayed long enough that I got to see a lot of, a lot of arcade, arcade games come and go. And that was the first place I actually ever played. Uh, well, it was a family comic when I played it there. So that was the first uh, real home system I had aside from, you know, little like systems that uh, in the seventies, I think my parents had bought, you know, that played Pong and things like that, but it wasn't even like an Atari. So that was sort of the background and, uh, and did a bit of uh, computer program work in, uh, oh, it would have been like 1980 when i was uh, in high school took an electronics class and we did programming so that was that was my uh, little bit of exposure to like basic and things like that so um but i've been around games and you know technology for a long time so yeah your, your time was, in japan uh, really interests me actually i mean that must have been a really exciting place to be i mean from what i read you were there in like the, the late 80s yeah 86 to 90 was with were, were the years that uh, that we stayed and yeah, I mean, it was part of the sort of economic bubble that they went through. So it was really nice. My wife is half Japanese, so we could stay and I didn't have to do any, you know, like have a sponsor or anything like that. And so I was basically tutoring English. And so it was nice and easy because there was, you know, people had a lot of money and I could sort of take on as many students as I wanted and made enough money to, you know, have a nice, you know, sort of decent lifestyle. And yeah, you know, just kind of enjoyed the country. And, you know, I would go to different parts of Tokyo almost every day and just kind of wander around until I had a class that would start or something and, uh, you know, then hop the trains and, and go to where I needed to go. But yeah, part of that day was spent, you know, wasting a, an hour or three in the arcades and stuff. But yeah, it was, it was a great time and uh, played a lot of stuff really, you know, got introduced to all kinds of different games at that time, which was great and kind of prepared me obviously for, for the time when I started at Nintendo. Well, it was kind of the electronic center of the universe right there. And, you know, there, there must have been amazing stuff on the streets and just walking around, seeing like all the new devices coming out in the 80s as well. Oh, yeah, it was it was it was pretty crazy. Crazy. I mean, I would go through Shinjuku, you know, most days because that was sort of the, the station that uh, my my train line dropped off uh, in the main part of Tokyo. And uh there was always lots of stores and things that you could go and wander around in um, in Shinjuku. And I would go over to Akihabara, which is, you know, the a sort of electronic city or whatever they call it. And uh, there was always stuff to, to wander around and look at there. So, yeah, there was so many things that were, you know, new and, and, and different and exciting. And, and yeah, it was it was a ton of fun and uh, sort of being young and not having any anything to really, you know, tie me down much in terms of uh, over overbearing time and things like that. I got to do a lot of exploring, which was fun. Well, was it your time in Japan that made you want to work in the industry? And how did that transition to you working for Nintendo? Well, so when I lived there, I had picked up, uh, you know, enough of the language to, to kind of get by. I didn't read a ton, but I could speak, you know, relatively well. And um, when I came back, uh, I had actually dropped out of university just um, because I'd kind of gotten bored with it and stuff, which was kind of too bad, I guess. But when I came back, I figured I should go back to school. And the thing that was attractive about Nintendo was when, and, and this was back in the day where they would just advertise for jobs in the newspaper. And uh, it was like uh, a job that I could work before I went to school, which made it really great for, you know, my studies and things like that. And uh, we got full benefits at like 30 hours of work, which was great. So yeah, as a company, it was, you know, a, a really good place to work. They, uh, they, they treated everyone well. And, and back in those days, when you first were hired, it was, you know, hired on as a Nintendo employee, you didn't have to go through sort of a temp agency, which these days you generally do. So yeah, it was kind of a, a special time. And being an employee was was a lot of fun. I, I didn't start in the games group. Um, I actually started in the customer service area. And, you know, going and, and deciding to work at Nintendo, you know, like I said, my time in Japan, I hoped was, was going to be a positive and, and that kind of thing. And maybe it did help um, with getting me hired. But, you know, it, it was funny. It was like, I remember you go and you would, you know, take sort of a, a test that checked to see if you knew how to hook up a television and things like that, you know, for 
for customer service because you were basically helping people with systems and stuff like that in the customer service area. And then later we started doing more gameplay stuff. And so I did some, some gameplay counseling kind of work as well. But yeah, I did that for a while until I got into the games group. I find it interesting you mentioned you started in customer service. I mean, did you get to man the infamous Nintendo hotline and oh, yeah. answer gamers' questions? What, what was that like then? Well, so yeah, so we did some... So so the way the, the whole sort of customer service slash sort of gameplay counselor thing happened is when I first started, there were people that were on the customer service side, and then there were people that um, were hired strictly for gameplay. I got in on the customer service side, and so we did things like ask or, uh, answered questions about how to hook up a system, you know, we would uh, set up Nintendo Power subscriptions. Um, we would, you know, set up the return numbers and things that when someone had a system that wasn't working and they needed to send it back for repair, we set that all up so that, you know, there was instructions for them so that we would uh, be able to take a system and repair it. So that was all the customer service side. And, and when I first started, that was the main work we did. And then the gameplay counselors, of course, answered questions on, you know, any game that somebody called in and, uh, had a question about if they could answer it. They usually could, but there were every, every once in a while, there'd be something really obscure and hard. But, you know, the, the customer service line was an 800 number and the gameplay counselor number was long distance. So um, for us, we, um, on the customer service side, we would get, you know, just tons of calls. And, you know, thankfully, most of them were legit, legit calls. Every once in a while, you get, you know, sort of weird ones. But um, at one point, they decided that because the, calls were so heavy for like the top 10 games, they asked if customer service people wanted to start taking gameplay calls for those top 10 games. And so I signed up for that and uh, ended up, you know, taking calls on things like Legend of Zelda and Super Mario Brothers 3 and, you know, all of the the main popular games that were out at that time. So um, I did a bit of those things. Um, and then I was probably in customer service for a couple of years. And then I actually did move into what they call the correspondence group where I wrote letters back to people. So that I did for like a year as well before I got into the games group. So I, I sort of saw a lot of the, you know, customer facing side of things uh, in that first two to three years. Well, obviously we're going to get into Earthbound soon, but I mean, obviously back then a lot of Nintendo games were Japanese conversions and famously a lot of them had very poor translation. Do you know what the process was for doing it? In, in kind of your early part of your career there? Well, I, I, I hesitate to say there was necessarily much of a process. It was, you know, there were a lot of games that really didn't have much, uh, you know, text in them and things like that. So it wasn't a big deal. Like the first game I worked on when I got into the games group was a, a game called Wario's Woods. It was kind of a puzzle game. It was kind of cool because it was the last NES game that Nintendo put out. So I got to work on that. And then they also did a Super NES version of it as well. But, um, you know, that had really minimal text. So that was, you know, a, a super simple kind of localization, if you will. But other games, you know, the process would be different from game to game. Some developers would, you know, do things like make text boxes that would fit the text that you wanted to put into it. And others, you would have to like count characters and, you know, you'd get like three lines and 40 characters per line. And that was all you would get. You know, and they, and depending on what they did in, in Japanese, you would only get that many text boxes as well. So the translating work was sort of varied from game to game, and, and it could be pretty hard at times. You were really into RPGs. Was there much of a market uh, for them in the USA, like outside of Zelda? You know? Well, so, you know, it was kind of interesting. I mean, the, the one thing that, that probably more than anything kind of, determined how well uh, RPGs were going to be received in the U.S. for a while, at least, was while I was in customer service, they had a deal where if you got a year of Nintendo Power Magazine, you would get the, well, they called it Dragon Warrior, and, and it was Dragon Quest in Japan, um, but you would get the first game in that series for free. So that was the game that, you know, most people got exposed to role-playing games with when you're talking about Nintendo. And, um, you know, for a lot of people, it wasn't something that they enjoyed that much, you know, because it was relatively grindy and, and you know, and a bit slow. And for a lot of people, it, it was something that they were happy to have the game for free um, because they were probably going to get Nintendo Power anyway, but um, didn't really like spark a huge RPG audience in the US, you know, even Final Fantasy when it came out. I mean, there was certainly people that played it and enjoyed it and stuff, but, you know, it wasn't like, uh, the huge kind of seller that it would become later. You were associate 
producer on Tin Star as well. What memories do you have of that? Well, so yeah, I mean, it was it was a game that you know we went back and forth with um, the developer, and I, I'm I'm going to totally blank on the developer's name all of a sudden, but um, you know they were in the UK, and I just remember that you know we did a lot of back and forth in terms of what was the best way to use the well, it was the Super Scope, it was called um, you know, so it was sort of the light gun. Uh, for the Super NES and how to make that sort of a, a fun part of the game. And, you know, I remember going back and forth about what to do with the, the sort of gun slinging uh, sort of portion of the game. But, you know, it was, it was, it was a fun time to just work on, on any game for me because Tin Star was the second game I worked on. And, you know, it was one where I had a bit more input into uh, stuff that was going on in the game. So, you know, but the developer was 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 really good. And I felt, you know, like the game, you know, at least did a, a pretty good job of representing what the Super Scope, you know, needed to do and be. But yeah, it was, you know, it, it was a kind of an interesting game. I, you know, I don't know if it sold well in the UK at all because it was a UK developer, but um, you know, it didn't do huge numbers in the US. But still, it was it was a fun a fun game to work on. And the Super Scope was such a cool accessory, wasn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people thought it was kind of you know you know a little too bulky and stuff. You know, sort of having to quote unquote you know put it on your shoulder and all this kind of stuff. But uh, you know, all of the light guns and and stuff like that that Nintendo supported for you know all those you know sort of years in those early systems. You know, I don't know that they ever got supported, you know, quite as well as they could have been, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tougher medium to like sort of build games for when, you know, you're, you're using a light gun, but it was, it was still fun to work on a system that, uh, or on a game that supported, you know, the light gun. Well, let's get into Earthbound then. Um, when did you first hear about it and how did you get involved in the project? Oh man, if I remember right, I mean, so I first heard about it, uh, I think from uh, a guy that actually still works at, Nin- at Nintendo named Dan Oson, who is a, uh, a guy who worked in, in what they called the Treehouse at that time. And I think initially they had, you know, asked Dan if he, you know, had time to work on it. And, I, and he kind of started doing some things for sort of like an internal demo and, and you know, did some localization work on, on a number of lines and, you know, probably got uh, a bit of the, the first town in and, and stuff like that. Well, I know he did because there's a, a couple of jokes in there that are definitely his. Um, but he worked on it for a bit. And then um, I think if I remember right, I think he was going to go work on Donkey Kong Country and didn't have time then to work on Earthbound and, you know, uh, suggested that maybe I'd be a good person to to work on it. And, you know, I was really excited to work on an RPG because, yeah, I had enjoyed them. And I think I knew that it wasn't going to necessarily be like a super high profile game, but just the idea that you get to work on a title that... Um, you know, has a lot of text and a lot of chance for, for creativity and things like that. You know, I, I, I was really excited to work on the game. Was there much of Dan's work left in the final product? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's certainly, um, you know, bits and pieces. You know, the, the two lines that I remember the most that I, I certainly know are things that, that were in when I got it. So I'm pretty sure that it's stuff that Dan did. But the Fuzzy Pickles line is, is one that Dan would have done. And yeah. then there's the line in the first town where you go up to a door and, and it, it's the yesterday joke, basically the Beatles uh, song yesterday. And um, it's like blank, 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 T E R D A Y. Do you know, you know what goes in the blank and it's yes, no, that was a Dan joke too. Those I remember I didn't do, but there was other, certainly a lot of other stuff in, in like the first town that I ended up doing because it wasn't all, you know, implemented early on. So, but he had, a, he had a few things certainly that were in there. I mean, obviously in Japan, it was known as a sequel to the game Mother that came out in 1989 that right. wasn't released in the US. How did you go about disassociating it with the Mother series for the American market? Well, I mean, it was it, it was one of those weird kind of things. Like, I, I'm, I think people that, you know, know the Earthbound franchise know that, uh, you know, the first one had actually been uh, localized. And so there was the the version floating around even in the office at the time of, of mother. And, you know, I had a chance if I, you know, they told me if I wanted to play it, I certainly could, but I don't think I, I if I remember right, I don't think I actually ever really played the first one, mostly because there was just so much work to do with, you know, with earthbound that I ended up feeling like I just didn't have time to, you know, put 40 hours or, 
or something into playing mother and just kind of dove into earthbound and started working on it right away. But it was, it was around and, you know, the, the similarities in terms of some of the story aspects and characters and things like that, um, certainly are there no matter what, um, because it's Etoy's writing and it's Etoy's story. And so there was, was going to be that, you know, thread no matter what, but, um, you know, for me, I kind of went into earthbound pretty fresh. You did the English localization. Did you change any aspects of the game or story to kind of fit that Western audience? Oh yeah. We, well, I mean, there was, there was a number of things that, that needed to change, um, for the game, but the one thing that, that Nintendo had was a number of standards that, they didn't necessarily care about in Japan, but they did care about for North America. Um, so there was a number of things that, you know, they changed to fit those, those standards in the U S like, for example, you, there was supposed to be, you know, no references to like alcohol, for example, in any game like that. So in the Japanese version, what basically references, what is essentially beer and people, you know, all know that and stuff. But in English, we changed it to coffee just to keep it, you know, safe on the Nintendo side. And, you know, we couldn't have any like religious references. Um, we had to take crosses out of the game. So there was all of this sort of visual stuff. We also, you know, did things like we changed the hospital from having a red cross to a green cross, um, all of that kind of normal stuff. But then, you know, in, in the course of just doing the localization for the language you know there was there was a handful of puzzles or things like that that um we did end up changing just because um you know there was the feeling that they were too quote unquote japanese if you will you know and the one thing that uh was was nice is that the developer in japan was or was a company called ape um, that i mentioned earlier and you know they really wanted uh, a good localization and so they were happy to do whatever it took they wanted the game to sell well in the united states uh of course and and you know so understandably they were you know excited to make sure that stuff was in there that would make sense to a u.s audience so so there were a few things that we um you know we went through and we decided uh it was worth changing and probably the most well-known example is that there's uh, a couple of blocking points uh in the game and in in japan they're like uh like octopus there's like a an iron octopus and you know it, it's a really japanese thing so they wanted us you know they, they were keen to sort of have us change it from an octopus to something else that you know could be equally goofy but you know a little less japanese culturally so you know in terms of trying to come up with something that, that would work um with the octopus you you have to get an, uh, an octopus eraser to get rid of this iron statue and then you can keep going and then there's another blocker in um in that same sort of vein that's uh it's a little japanese doll um and these japanese dolls dolls are called kokeshi and the word to erase in japanese is well eraser i should say is is keshi um like keshi gomu is, is what you would call like a pencil eraser and um so there was a sort of play on words with the kokeshi keshi because you would have to erase the uh, the kokeshi doll so in terms of trying to think of something to come up with to replace it with you know sort of took a few weeks to try to think of things and then you know you just start running out of time and you just sort of say okay we're, we're going to go with this and so we ended up with a pencil an iron pencil and then a, and then an eraser so you have to erase the pencil and then you have to you know do the eraser eraser to erase the the other iron eraser to get past that so that was probably the most um you know involved change in a sense just because we had to change the artwork as well text wise we changed tons of stuff though well i was going to ask about that actually because i know the game was actually known for its humor which was quite different to a lot of you know rpgs at the time and did you find there was like a, a difference between what a japanese audience would find humorous and an american audience did you have to change much of the humor in the game you know the funny thing is i would say no not not in i mean we would change a lot of the japanese references and you know things that are you know definitely japanese we would we would go in and, and redo or retouch but we would sort of try to keep it in that same kind of vein you know when i when i started working on it the developer basically said you know in japanese this is a weird game it's got a lot of odd things in it in japanese and there's a lot of jokes that people don't necessarily get either. And, 
and they told me, you can be as kind of quirky as you want to be. Um, so it was great to have that kind of support and just to sort of go in and, and, and do what I thought could be, you know, a lot of fun. And, you know, the great thing is, is that I, the, the group I was in, you know, I didn't work inside the treehouse. Um, I was in a different group that was in a different part of the floor because there were basically two development groups um, at Nintendo at that time. And um, the thing that was great is that the guys I worked with were all, we were all really good friends and had a lot of fun and did a lot of joking around and stuff. And some of those things got incorporated into Earthbound. And it was, you know, a really easy thing to sort of be in that atmosphere and create sort of a very goofy, sort of quirky game like that. Um, and I drew on a lot of stuff that, you know, I had seen and just entertainment and stuff I had seen over the years. I don't know, this is probably not terribly, uh, you know, politically correct to say this these days, sadly. But like, I used to watch Benny Hill when I was a kid. So there were jokes from Benny Hill that I kind of threw in every once in a while here or there, just kind of variations of, of a Benny Hill, you know, sort of, you know, little joke. Um, so there was that kind of stuff. There was Looney Tunes kind of Bugs Bunny kind of stuff in there that, you know, I, I sort of took variations of. So I, I was lucky. I got to do all kinds of weird sort of quirky stuff when uh, when I was, was writing the game. And because it was weird and quirky in Japanese, I, it was it was pretty easy to make it weird and quirky in English. I also think as well, talking about the differences, you know, the fact that the game was essentially set in America. Admittedly, it was called Eagle Land, but, you know, it was meant to be America. So kind of translating the Japanese impression of America to an American audience, was that much of a challenge? Well, so so I think one of the advantages I had um, was the fact that I had lived in Japan for those four years. So I had really kind of gotten used to what Japanese people's image of America is during that time that I lived there. Um, so it, it made it easier for me, I think, to, um, you know, to deal with that sort of odd, you know, sort of outsider's view of what the U.S. is than, than maybe other people. And so, and, and so I didn't feel, you know, too bad about leaving in sort of odd things that Itoy had written. And, you know, I was perfectly fine with sort of having America have this weird, idealized, you know, kind of view. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have any problems doing it. it. It wasn't difficult for me, I don't think. Other people may have had a bit more of a tough time, not if, if you didn't have that sort of cultural background of understanding how Japanese people view America, but I was fortunate that I, I, I kind of knew that. Did you end up collaborating with the Japanese team much? Like, it must be really challenging in the pre-internet era. Um, oh, yeah. So the the thing that I was immensely fortunate to have was uh, a guy came over to the U.S. from Ape. Um, his name was Masayuki Miyuta. And so Miyuta-san and I worked just side by side, basically, for, you know, he was in the U.S. for, geez, like a, like a good probably six weeks, something like that. And so every day he would kind of explain to me things that, you know, I was seeing in the text because the game wasn't playable for a good while because they were making all of these changes, um, you know, to, to graphics and, you know, putting in rules to deal with American grammar versus Japanese grammar. Um, so it wasn't really playable. And so, and, and basically we were, I was working off of like stacks of paper, um, which is, goes back to the question about process. There really wasn't much of a process, unfortunately, but you know, it's what we had. And he had a small, uh, sort of portable word processor. And so he had all of those text files loaded into the word processor and he would go in and, you know, put in translations that I would do on the paper. And so he was doing a lot of data entry and also explaining things to me as we went through the process. And so he would try to explain to me, you know, what was going on when a line was spoken and, you know, that whether it was, you know, crucial to the story or even if it was just something that was, you know, sort of a NPC line that didn't necessarily have uh, much to do with um, aspects of the game, but it was great because I could go in and, you know, kind of write uh, knowing a bit more about what was going on around that line. But other than that, I mean, and, and the thing is when you look at the text files, it, it isn't like in sequence or anything. It's just stuff is sort of scattered all over. And I've, I've told people this before, and I think it's, it's really true. I was really fortunate as well that the game was as quirky and weir as weird as it was because I could get away with sort of odd sounding lines that I didn't necessarily intend to sound as odd as they may, because 
I didn't right. <laughs> necessarily 100% know what was going on before or after that line. So sometimes the oddity is just by chance. So yeah, it, you know, I got and I got lucky because you know having a weird game, you, you get away with a lot more. Well, what was the time pressure like working on the game? I mean, I read that you only had a few months to do it. That must have been like insanely long days. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, I suppose that the the example I can give as to sort of the time pressure. Um, so if I remember right, it was pretty much right after Christmas. And my first daughter was born on February 8th. And um, that day I was out of the office for her getting born. But then I went into the office every day straight for like the next 28 days. And I mean, not necessarily proud of it, but it was a different time, I guess is the best way to say it. Because my daughter was born and they knew I had worked on it so hard, Masayuki Miyuta asked me, do I want to put my daughter's name in the game somewhere? And, you know, I thought about it and I thought, yeah, sure, why not, you know? And there's a part of the game called Magicant and there's a, a little girl character in the in, in the Magicant area who in Japanese just says um, something like, let's run and dance and play, something along those lines. But I changed it or he let me change it to my name is Nico which is my daughter's name, um, Let's Run and Dance and Play. So I got to put the name in, and for a while, people didn't really understand why that character had a name, and so many other characters in the game don't. So it was kind of funny for a while. That was kind of a, a weird little speculative thing that the uh, Earthbound fandom would would guess about and stuff. But um, that that was probably the most Easter eggy thing I think you know we put in. I mean, just for personal stuff, there's things in the game that, you know... Um, I I put in because, like I said, the guys I worked with were pretty funny. There's a there's a line at the end of the game where Pokey says, um, at one of his very last lines is, is he says to you, he says, spankity, spankity, spankity. And this is something that someone in the games group used to say. And I always yeah. liked it and thought it was funny. And so I put it in. And, you know, for me, knowing that that was, you know, uh, a guy I worked with who who had a really good sense of humor, you know, a line from him, you know, was, was kind of a nice thing for me, but, you know, it doesn't really mean much for anybody else. But, you know, for me, that's that's the kind of little Easter egg that I kind of got. Well, one thing about the game that gives it some serious pedigree is the fact that it was produced by Satoru Iwata, who, of course, went on to become Nintendo's president and CEO. Yeah. Um, that must give the game some real credence these days. Oh, you know, it's it's funny. I, um, I went back and looked at the credits on the Super NES Classic, and um, for some reason, I think someone sent me the, the, the credits list from the game for whatever reason. Oh, I think they were sending me the credits because I actually had another game on the Super NES Classic as well. But um, that's a sort of separate story. But um, and I went and I and I looked at the, the credits and I realized that my name appeared right below Iwata-san's name. So I, I remember when I saw that, I was like, you know, it was a bittersweet kind of, you know, moment. Immortalized. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. I mean... Yeah, and, and even though, you know, the, when the game came out, it didn't sell, and it wasn't that popular, obviously. You know, I had put so much time and effort and sort of, you know, a lot of just my own personality into the game. It was certainly disappointing that it didn't sell, but I felt like I had done just about everything I could. And, you know, at least when I saw the reviews and stuff, there wasn't many that said, you know, that the writing or whatever was, was the part that was the issue. And, uh so at least I knew that I didn't, uh, you know, do anything to mess up or, you know, whatever you want to say. That, you know, it was it was satisfying that it, it, it made it at least a, an impact. But yeah, for a long time, I didn't I didn't even talk about the game with people. Well, I think, you know, the fact that it's become a cult classic proves what a quality job both the Japanese and your, your team in America did as well uh, on the game. And I know Nintendo did spend about $2 million on the marketing, which at the time, I know, I remember reading that it was quite controversial. And a lot of people think they did completely the wrong thing in the marketing of that game. And that was a reason that, you know, it didn't sell as well as it should. What was your opinion of their marketing efforts back then? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, you know, playing up the sort of grossness or whatever you want to call it uh, that the marketing campaign kind of did i wasn't i wasn't sure if that was necessarily the right, the right way to play it but i mean knowing that the game was sort of quirky and funny and and interesting in so many different ways and and stuff i i kind of figured it you know it was their expertise and you sort of hope that they're right i know that like you said a lot of people sort of 
downplayed the the marketing as as being uh, much of a help to the game. I mean, in retrospect, you know, you sort of wonder if you want to necessarily say this game stinks for a marketing line, but that's that's what they did, and you know, you, you kind of hope that that wasn't a reason why it didn't sell. But you know, to be honest, if I had to pick one reason that it didn't sell, I think for me. Um, the biggest reason was the cost. I'll be honest, mm. you know, and and you know, graphics secondary, just because at that time everybody wanted the best looking graphics you could get. But really, the cost was was a, certainly another factor in my opinion because it was, I think, in in some places it was eighty dollars US to to buy the big box, and that's a lot of money, and it was a lot of money in those days. And I think as well, you know, that this game stinks. It seemed very um Nintendo like at the time. I mean, it kind of felt more like something Sega would have done. Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, now that you mention it, I mean, I suppose that there may have easily been some of that uh, desire to, you know, steal some of the, the, the Sega thunder, if you will, because, yeah, Sega had that, that reputation for being, you know, a rule breaker and, you know, more brash and, uh, you know, sort of in your face. And I think that uh, Nintendo was probably at that time thinking, okay, maybe we need to you know, get a little more edgy. And um, that might have been a part of the decision making process. And, uh, and I think that, like I said, I, I like to hope that it didn't really necessarily make a huge difference. But I know that it's it's been criticized over the years, certainly. Well, there was a huge kind of RPG import scene, like we mentioned, and uh, the game got a cult following. Did you see this as something special? Yeah, you know, so in terms of the, the actual following, so so this is, this is sort of another sort of angle that, like I mentioned, I mean, I probably went through a period of four to five years where, you know, I didn't really even think much about the game because when you work in the game business, you know, you work on a title, you ship the game and, you know, ideally you've got another project to move on to right away. And so, you know, that was the way it was for me. And so, you know, I had moved on in my career. I I ended up leaving Nintendo in in 96 and, and went to EA and worked on sports stuff. Um, you know, and that was a lot of work and, and, you know, sort of high pressure in a lot of ways because you're working on a game that has to be released every year. So, you know, you've got to get everything done. And so I was there for a couple of years and, you know, it's very heads down and, and very focused. And, uh, at the end of the day, I didn't even really know that Earthbound had gathered, you know, much of a following. I just sort of figured, you know, it, it, it didn't necessarily review that well. You know, I had seen it in bargain bins here and there and probably should have bought a few of them, but never did Um, because I had my own copy. So I didn't really think about it. But um, yeah, they're worth a bit now, aren't they? (laughs) Yeah, sadly. (laughs) Yeah. Knowing what they're worth now, I wish I would have grabbed a few. But with all of that stuff that I had seen, I didn't even really think much about the game and didn't even really bring it up much. I mean, I worked with guys you know, at the end of the 90s, who later on came back and told me, they said, how come you never told me you worked on Earthbound? And I just said, I didn't think it was a big deal when, when we were working together. But, you know, slowly, I, I, I became aware, and I don't even remember why or how, maybe it was because I was looking up a date for the game for when it actually came out. And I did a Google search in, in those days, or well, it wouldn't have been Google. It would have been AOL search. Or Alta something. Vista or something. Yeah. yeah Alta Vista. Yeah. <laughs> ask, yeah. ask Jeeves. <laughs> ask Jeeves. Yeah. There's your other, <laughs> we can grab all of our old search engine names. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, it would have been one of those I'm sure. And, and I, and I suspect, you know, it would have been the kind of thing where, where starman.net popped up. And I remember, you know, the first time I ever looked at it and I thought, oh, it's got a few fans. It's kind of nice. You know, I'm glad that it didn't get totally forgotten. And then, you know, every few months I would think, oh, maybe I'll just pop in and take a look. And and the fandom is, you know, I, I realized pretty quickly, you know, very dedicated. And, you know, that was the place where I first sort of saw people post and say, why is this character named Nico in the game? And that's what sort of made me kind of think, okay, it's it's kind of fun to come back and read people's theories about why there's a, a character named Nico. And, you know, of course, nobody guessed correctly. I mean, they all had other ideas, you know, whether it was Ness's old girlfriend or something weird like this, you know. But um, it was always kind of fun to read. You know, and I don't think I actually explained it to anybody until might have been 2013 was the first time I met somebody from uh, Fan Gamer, which is what 
you know, the company that Starman had, had kind of started up. And um, I was going to the PAX convention and I thought, well, I might as well just go up and just let them know that I worked on it and, you know, thank them for the fact that they kept the, the game alive all these years. And, um, you know, went up and introduced myself to somebody and <laughs> it was kind of cool. I mean, they, they, they kind of got all excited and uh, called in people and brought them over and ended up meeting a bunch of them and, and things and have generally kept the relationship going, you know, all these years with, uh, with those guys. They're, they're a really good group. You know, the game at the time, like you said, that the sales figures were disappointing, but in the decades that have followed, it's got this cult following now and this really loyal audience. And I think that that must have seemed like validation did it when it was included and opened up to a whole new audience who didn't get to experience it back in the day, apart from like on grey imports outside of Japan and North America, when it was included on the Super Nintendo Classic, the mini system. Were you aware that that was going to happen? And what, what did you think of it? So, no, I wasn't aware of it. But I was, you know, kind of pleasantly surprised that they, you know, thought that it was was worth pretty putting in. Um, you know, I'll, I'll 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 be honest. The, the the moment where I felt like it was, you know, the most validating, I guess, you know, for the work I did on the game was, you know, thankfully, and I don't know that this would happen anymore, but um, probably five, six, seven, eight years ago, there was two or three like top one hundred games of all times lists. And Earthbound ended up being inside in, in those lists, and that was the moment where I thought, okay, I you know maybe I can you know go ahead and die now and be fine, um, because I would have never thought that I would have worked on a game that was you know in the top 100 games of all time. You also did the uh, localization for Star Fox Two in 2019. That was the other one. Yeah, that was <laughs> the other one that was on that was on the, the Super NES Classic that it didn't ship for years and years, and and it was you know. I've been fortunate in my career. I've actually shipped, you know, pretty much everything I've worked on, except for that one didn't. And we actually had finished it, but, you know, it was for Super NES. And, you know, it it, it basically turned into, you know, the N64 version of Star Fox. But they had done Star Fox 2. And, yeah, I got to uh, to do the, the, the localization work on that, too. And that was, that was one that was like a, a tougher localization in a way, just because it was, like I mentioned before, they had, like, strict text box limits and so all of the text in japanese which is you know it, because it's symbols you get a lot more into a single symbol than in english where we have to spell it out with multiple characters um that was a lot harder a, a localization in a weird way than you know sort of the stuff i did in, in in earthbound i mean earthbound was hard because it was just a lot but you know sort of mechanically it was easier in a sense to do the 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 earthbound localization because Star Fox 2, because I only had a certain number of characters and I would like pour over the text over and over just for like single characters and, you know, using contractions of words just to gain an extra character to get one word and turn it from a singular thing to a plural thing because in English it makes a difference. Whereas in Japanese, they don't really have that stuff like that, you know, but yeah, it was, it was fun working on that game too. You know, it was a long, long time ago, but I mean, I, 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 I remember, you know, sort of communicating with Dylan Cuthbert a bit, um, which is kind of cool. Um, oh, wicked. Uh, from Argonaut. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I know he's still in Japan. I follow him on Twitter, which is kind of nice. And, uh, you know, he's done so much stuff over the years. But, yeah, it was, it was you know, one of, those, one of those other games that, you know, I'm pretty proud to have worked on as well. Well, he went to EA after Nintendo. How did that come about? And what was it like working for Electronic Arts at that time? So I went to EA because, you know, I... When I worked it in a way, you know, I kind of always knew that generally you're you're not going to get to do much in the way of of working with the actual development team unless I would have like moved to Japan. And because I had a family, that wasn't really as much of an option. But you know, I wanted to be involved with the development team more closely. So going to Electronic Arts, I went to EA Canada where they were working on on the sports stuff, and I had always you know and, and enjoyed sports and, and sports games as well. When I first got there, I got there because I was doing localization. So I ended up doing localization work for like, uh, there was a Need need for Speed title. Um, I think it was Need for Speed SE that came out on the PC. Um, I also worked on localization for NHL and for uh, NBA Live. That was the, those were the titles that were in the group I was, uh, I was attached to at uh, EA, in EA Canada. And so my first year was strictly doing localization across all of those various titles. And then the next year, um, I moved into just sort of the associate producer role and worked on NBA Live 98. 
and still ended up t- t- taking care of the localization for uh, NBA Live, but uh, you know, also served as the uh, associate producer of, of that. And uh, it was a pretty crazy time as well, just because, like I like I mentioned, it's 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 a tough environment where you've got to put out you know a game every year, and you know, there's really nothing worse you know for a sports game than to miss the opening day of a of a sports season and you know so we would do everything possible to to make those dates and you know and it was you know a bit of sleeping under your desk and and things like that um so you know development wise it was sort of classic old time you know sort of crunchy development schedule but in the end i mean the games were always i think pretty good quality so um, you know, we were proud of what we did and, you know, it was a good group of guys up there too. Um, but with NBA live, it was very much, you know, sort of built around, you know, as much realism, you know, as you could sort of put into the game, um, but still be fun. So, you know, their, their goal was to make it, you know, closer to a, a, a more of a simulation than, you know, sort of a, a jam type of game. But, um, you know, we, we did have to do a lot of work with the NBA. I mean, we got, things like player portraits and um, we worked with, uh, you know, known announcers for NBA games. Um, You know, when I worked on the localization, I was fortunate because I also got to go over to like France and, and work with, you know, a nationally known French NBA announcer in France um, and Italy and Spain. And, and, you know, it was, it was nice to see how popular the NBA was even in Europe at that time. Well, you were planning on doing a book as well, and uh, I heard Nintendo kind of blocked it. What was the story there? Oh, you know, I, I I still know guys over at Nintendo. And, you know, I had thought, you know, it would be maybe kind of fun to just put out a book that just kind of ran through the lines of, of Earthbound. And, you know, if there was a story behind anything in particular, you know, go, go ahead and jot it down and, and maybe do a, a book that would you know, hopefully sort of give fans a, a little more insight into the, you know, individual bits in the game and stuff like that. And um, I went and talked to a friend of mine and, and I mentioned it and I think he decided, you know, well, maybe I should ask and see if anybody, you know, is going to care about it. And and I and it may have even been that I asked him, you know, go ahead and double check and see if anybody's going to have an issue. And, and, I, and then when I talked to him later, they said, well, you know, they'd rather you didn't if you, uh, you know, they, I mean, I think they knew that they, couldn't really stop me, quote unquote. But, you know, they sort of said they'd prefer me not to. And, you know, in thinking about it, I decided that out of respect to the company that, you know, gave me my start and things like that, um, I would sort of acquiesce to their request. So, so in the end, I did not do it, which is, you know, kind of too bad in a way. But it's one of those things that Nintendo is very protective of, of stuff. And, you know, even though it, it if I remember right, they sort of made it sound like, well, they don't want people to know about what, you know, our process was. Well, like I said, there was really no process. I mean, it was just brute force sort of work. But, you know, because they had made that request and, and like I said, out of out of just respect to the company and stuff, I decided not to do it. But yeah, it's just it was kind of too bad. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like they sent me a weird like cease and desist letter or something weird like that. There wasn't anything. It was it's much more of the gentleman's agreement kind of a thing almost. Which is why it's been great to hear your stories, Marcus, because, I mean, you know, we found doing the show that we've had several guests on that worked for Sega back in the day, but, you know, Nintendo, it, it is quite hard to kind of get in there and find out what happened inside the company. So it has been really interesting finding out your, your memories and what it was like working there back then. Well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and there's so much stuff that, you know, was going on at that time, and, and it was really, you know, an exciting time in the industry and an exciting time at Nintendo, and... uh you know, I was I was really fortunate to be there, and I was really fortunate to get to work on the stuff I did. And um, so, yeah, I, I you know I I know that uh, Nintendo has been a, a huge part of people's lives, and and there's always lots of questions. And that's the part that I, I wish Nintendo was a little more responsive to at times is just understanding that there are people that view Nintendo and the games and things like that as a as a huge part of their life, and and you know yeah. forming their uh, you know, opinions and hobbies and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, that's that's a part of it that I'm always a little bit disappointed that Nintendo doesn't do more for, but they're a big company and they kind of make their own choices, I guess. What are you working on these days, then, Marcus? You, you still in the games industry? I am. Um, after, after working at a number of different places, I actually had a company for about 10 years that uh, me and a couple of guys uh, started. And so we did a lot of consulting work and, and things like that with uh, – 
with various groups. But um, then just uh, recently, at the beginning of this year, I started working with a, a small indie company called Poorly Timed Games, who are kind of working on a, a, a game that uh, hopefully they're they're an indie developer and they're they're hoping to get funding. And um, so I've been, you know, really happy to work with them. They're a really good group. I'm desperately hoping that we get our funding in line. And once that happens, everything will, uh, you know, hopefully be in place for at least a couple of years, I would think. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm working with those guys and, and kind of in a producer project management sort of uh, role. And, you know, it's, it's been a interesting year just because of COVID and things, but yeah, they're, they're scattered all over the place and uh, doing the, the best I can to, you know, help kind of wrangle the project. It really does feel like the indie scene has kind of brought a lot of excitement back to gaming, a lot of creativity as well. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, really the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, the industry has changed so much. I mean, whether it's the indie scene because of, you know, the ability to self-publish is is so different than it was years and years ago. And, and even though this started more than five to eight years ago, but it became so much easier now is, is things like just being able to update games after you release them and, you know, put in... Yeah, more content and stuff is so much nicer than it used to be years ago. And then obviously the rise of like mobile games and things has has given life to, you know, just tons and tons of companies. And uh, so the industry has changed a ton from when I remember it 25 years ago. But, you know, at its heart, it's still, you know, it's nice because it's still trying to do the, the same thing it was back then, which is, you know, create good, solid entertainment for people. And, uh, the industry being as big and popular and widespread as it, as it is now across the world is is super encouraging for me just as uh, being a part of the game development community but yeah i i'm i'm hopeful that it you know keeps going i i, I do love the indie scene though you know being a part of an indie is a, a certainly a, a very special thing well marcus it's amazing that the passion for the video games industry still burns inside you and for the medium as well and long may it continue. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories with us. Well, thank you very much, Dan and Robbie. It was my pleasure as well. I, uh, I've, I've been like super happy to see all of the all of the stuff you guys have done with the podcast too. So, you know, I hope you guys keep going for a long time with that as well. Mm-hmm.